You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jean Meltzer on the show with me. She has a, an amazing book uh, that's just releasing today when you're hearing this. It's called The Matzah Ball, and it's so much fun. I, I know you guys are going to love this. You know, we're... We're uh, starting that uh, that fast downhill run toward the holiday season, and uh, you know it's uh, it it has taken me by surprise like it does every year, and uh, you know there's there's nothing like a great uh, uh, holiday themed book to get you in the mood for the season, and this is a great way to start. This is a must have on your to be read pile for this season for sure. Welcome to the show, Jean. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, Jean, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, great question. Um, so for me, you know, I think I've always been uh, drawn to the uh, written word. I can still remember um, learning my ABCs in preschool. Uh, but I think the first time I actually knew I wanted to be an, a writer was I was in sixth grade and I wrote uh, for an assignment um, a short story. And I guess my teacher at the time, she had seen something sort of unique or special about it. So she had me read it to the class and the whole class was laughing and they were hysterical and it began sort of this pattern um, in my school year where I would write these stories or these limericks or these humorous sort of um, tales and I would read them to my class. And I think seeing the reaction um, of my friends and classmates and sort of being able to be distinct in that way sort of uh, solidified for me that I was going to be writing stories for the rest of my life. And that's that's what happened. <laughs> I, I, I love that so much. And I love that there's a uh, there's a definitive point where, mm, you know, you, you just kind of know that that's what's going to happen. Um, you know, as as um, this happens with a lot of writers, they, they can point to a definitive moment. Um what what did you do from that moment on that that led you to where you are? You know, some people and and they're they're a little rare. I've I've met uh, quite a few though, and in, in doing this show, that say I knew I was going to be a writer, and the only thing I've ever pursued is that. And every mm-hmm. every life choice I've made has forwarded me, you know, on that journey. And then you know, for a lot of us, it's. Uh, you know, writing is a bit of a circuitous route and, uh, you know, it has a way of coming back around to you Absolutely. when you've gained some life experience. What, what was that like for you? So for me, it was definitely circuitous. Um, I I continued on that path, that trajectory from sixth grade, uh, knowing I was going to be a writer. And I actually wound up going to a NYU Tisch uh, to study screenwriting. Um, And I graduated and I wound up in television and I was very successful uh, kind of right off the bat in television. Um, I wound up winning uh, an Emmy uh, at 24 uh, for the first program I ever wrote, which was um, Assignment Discovery. But um, what happened was I wasn't that happy. Um, So I sort of had like been writing, writing, writing. I'm in entertainment. I'm very successful. Um, But I realized I was sort of living for my goals and not for my values. And so at that point, I actually uh, decided to quit my job in entertainment industry and go into rabbinical school. Um, And so I then spent five, six years um, studying in various seminaries, universities. That was also a whole long journey. Um, But unfortunately, the chronic illness I had um, from when I was 18, ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome worsened, and I had to withdraw from school. Um, And so I sort of found myself in the last decade homebound. Um, I have a wonderful, supportive husband, but uh, my life is definitely uh, 
marred by disability. And it sort of brought me back to my roots, which was writing. And so, you know, God works in mysterious ways, they always say. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I never in a thousand years uh, that I'd be writing Jewish romances, but um, it's, it's, you know, like I said, circuitous, and I feel like I wound up exactly where I was supposed to be. And, and isn't that the greatest feeling when yes. you get there and you say, I have no idea how I got here, but I'm so happy that I yes. am here. <laughs> yes. And, and my, my cup filled over, I am filled with gratitude. I love it. I love it. Um, from from writing, uh, you know, in the entertainment industry to mm. rabbinical school, um, <laughs> to talk a little bit about that decision because you know I I think a lot of people are conflicted, um, mm. and and some people feel like um, that they're perfectly fine having one foot in 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 one area and another foot in the other and and straddling and and uh, and, and and you know merging those two pursuits in life but um it sounds like to me that this was uh this was one of those times where you had to make a a firm decision and change w what was that like uh terrifying obviously <laughs> um you know uh um what was that it was very hard but you know for me i think uh you know i come from more of a jewish sort of secular background um, but I, as I sort of grew into my adulthood, like I said, wanting to live for my values, but I also found that being Jewish was sort of a core part of my identity and that I sort of needed to live Jewishly in order to be happy. And so for me, it was, you know, I kind of joke that I'm someone who's sort of incapable of not following my heart. I am passionate to the point of recklessness. And I think that's always sort of been my journey. When I sort of get an idea in my head, I follow it. Um, I, I am a firm believer that, you know, the little voice inside of you tells you where you need to be. I also don't think it's completely unusual that writers tend to have one foot in sort of a spiritual or meditative. I have a lot of writer friends who are also yoga teachers or have spent time in sure. seminary themselves. So I actually don't, I think there's something about the creative process or the creative people that we just tend to be a little um, more thoughtful or reflective. But I mean, I think it's interesting. I think, is it hard to do both? And I don't know, the world is changing so much and there's so much space now for all different types of stories and journeys. And I think writers use who they are and what they have and what they know to create those stories. Jean, what do you, um, can you attribute, uh, you know, that, that turn in your journey um, where, where you left writing for the entertainment industry, going to rabbinical school, um, connecting deeper with your faith, um, mm -hmm. Can you look at the art that you're making now? And, you know, we're specifically, you know, talking about your new book, The Matzo Ball. Mm -hmm. um, but can can you point to anything that that has that because of that turn that you made and that that, you, um, you know, where where your path changed? Can mm -hmm. you point to anything that 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 has added to your creative life, to your um, uh your life as an artist by by doing that has it given you new tools that maybe you didn't have before oh absolutely i mean i didn't really have the education to sort of write the matzo ball in the way i can now uh five six ten years ago so i really did need to sort of learn my own background in order to put that into the book i also think you know, uh, struggling with your own questions, struggling with your own sort of issues of faith or or, uh, or even just finding humor in whatever struggles you have um, has been, you know, part of my imperative as a writer. So um, absolutely, I think I think it completely wound up informing the book. There's no way I could have written the matzo ball the way it was written now if I had not gone to rabbinical school. It was absolutely fundamental. You you mentioned humor uh, just mm. a minute ago, and the, the matzo ball is full of <laughs> just vibrant humor, and that that's Thank the best you. way I can explain it. There's just this this love of life that that mm. comes uh, that you know comes off the page and and to the reader. Um, I know that you and and you mentioned it a minute ago have had a health struggle that that uh, you know sidelined you know some of your pursuits and um, and it, it's been a real struggle for you through the years um, yes. but in reading the book 
Um, I, I get the impression that humor is uh, it is important to you, and it and it's something that uh, you know. Without meeting you before today, I just got the impression that that Jean is uh, is a person <laughs> that you just want to be around. Um, how is, how uh, how has that humor um, you know played out in your life, and and how important you know as, as the with the challenges that you've gone through, you never lost your sense of humor. Um, yeah. c- could you talk a little bit about that? I think, you know, chronic illness across the spectrum of chronic illness, I think is, it brings you very much to your lowest, lowest, darkest places. You, you sort of get stripped of your identity. So all the things that make us who we are, whether it's our career or our ability to raise a family or our ability to, you know, uh, um, go to the PTA meetings or whatever it is that makes our identity us. Um, it kind of gets stripped away through illness. You have to sort of learn to navigate and manage through that. And the way you survive that, the people who can kind of uh, find their way through the darkness of those days, I think you have to really have an ability to hold on to your joy. You have to find the humor in the worst moments. I mean, that is in so many ways the human, you know, condition and the human struggle. So, yeah, I think I think I've had 20 years, 20 plus years now of learning how to hold on to my joy is what I call it. Um, and so when I believe it or not, I wrote the matzo ball in the midst of the pandemic. And um, I think the, one of the reasons that my books uh, come off and my my energy is so happy and joyous is because in order to sort of navigate through my own struggles and my own suffering, I've had to hold on to my joy. And it's definitely something that I, it's sort of my, if I have a message for the world, it's that we have to just find ways to be positive, to stay happy, to, to focus on the good of the world. Absolutely. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it 
a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. So, um, Gene, I'm I'm fascinated by the beginnings of things, uh, mm-hmm. where the the moment of creation. Uh, at one moment, uh, the matzo ball did not uh, exist in any form or fashion. Mm-hmm. It, it just didn't exist. And then either, um, and and you tell me what it was like for you, but either a character walks onto the stage of your mind and then you're like, oh, it, you know, and she tells you that, that her name is Rachel or, mm-hmm. or, you know, what, or you think of a situation like, you know, what would happen if this thing happened during this situation? That would be funny to watch. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it starts playing out. And then in, in some fashion, the matzo ball, the book that, that you've written and, and now published does exist. And then it's your job as the writer to kind of excavate that story and to bring it out of the imagination and, and make, you know, an, a real story out of it. What What is that first moment of inspiration mm-hmm. like for you? So I knew that I wanted to attempt writing a Jewish romance, and I felt very keenly that it had to be a Hanukkah romance. And so like many authors, I sat down to sort of plot out an outline and play with some pages and ideas. And I I had an idea of what I wanted to do, which is I wanted to sort of take all the tropes uh, you would see in a typical sort of like Christmas, holiday, Hallmark style romance, but make it feel authentically Jewish. And so I played around with some ideas. I, you know, was making a a character as a baker or a seamstress. And no matter what I did with these pages, I hated them. I I would look at them. They felt so inauthentic to um, my experience. And I wound up one night, it was uh, having dinner with my husband. I said, you know, the problem is that like Jews of my generation, I'm a third generation American Jew, um, we're not bakers, we're not seamstresses, um, we are educated professionals, lawyers, doctors, and writers. And at that moment, I sort of had this idea, like, what if this is a nice Jewish girl who <laughs> is writing Christmas romances? And in my mind, I went, what if Debbie Maycomer was actually Devorah McComer Witch? And so that was the moment it took off. And I knew from there I had to raise the stakes. You know, the tr- truth is not for every Jew there's any tension between celebrating Christmas or loving Christmas or romance, you know, it being loving the lights. I mean, for a lot of Jews, that's not an issue. Um, so I knew in terms of raising the stakes that like she had to come from an observant family. And and right away, again, my background, I went back to, oh, not just an observant family, her father is a world famous, you know, mock me of strict rabbi. And so that set it off. And that really and from there, I just wanted as much anything I was just sort of like pulling and having fun with like various cultural aspects of Judaism. So I was like, I'm gonna have them have met in summer camp. And you know, Jacob's father's interest in baseball and the matzo ball is actually a real event. It's a giant Jewish singles event um, in lots of towns uh, and cities uh, held on Christmas Eve. So I was really trying to pull things that I would want to see in a book that would feel real to me, you know, but but it frame it in sort of this classic tropey holiday romance. But the idea originally came sitting at dinner with my husband and just talking it through. I love that so much. That is that, you know, from that moment of, of what if to, you know, then seeing, you know, this full story that, that just kind of explodes from there and the, yeah. the dynamic excitement that, that comes from that is, is, I just love that so much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you are, you're kind of, um, peeling back the layers of, uh, tradition and, um, and a lot of expectations, you know, from from older relatives and and people that um, uh, just expectations that are passed down. And mm. and you're you are you do such a great job in this book of of being able to show um, people like me that didn't grow up the way you did mm. um, what it looks like on the inside, while never losing your sense of humor and never feeling uh I, I guess what i'm trying to say is there there's something about 
taking um, aspects of our culture and, mm. and, and our religion and things that are very precious to us, but being able to um, to see the the levity in it and to to see, you know, to, to um, kind of poke fun a little bit, um, mm-hmm. but not in a mean way um, at at. at you know, the things that make us who we are. Um, did, did you ever worry about that? Did, did it ever feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm holding this a little too precious or, uh, you know, I'm being too serious with this, or did you ever find, you know, I, I think I, I was a little flip in the way I, you know, maybe I need to revisit that, that paragraph or, or did, you know, were those things ever, um, you know, things that you worried about or, or fretted over? Um, I was, I would say that I definitely, uh, I, I thought through probably every decision in the book I, I thought through, um, and I definitely was, was thinking about the Jewish community and the MECFS community. Um, when you're writing a book, you know, I, I had a wide spectrum of religious uh, experiences that I knew would be reflected or be reading the book. And I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, whether you were not Jewish or whether you were from or very observant, as we would call it, from adjacent, that you would find your footing in the book. And for MECFS people, I really felt it was very important to sort of, especially because we are sort of an invisible disease, we are sort of an orphan disease. I did feel it was really important to sort of explain what CFS is, to make visible what is so often invisible, um, and to be a voice for people who have not had a voice for decades. So, I mean, I think if there's moments of seriousness in the book, that's absolutely um it was absolutely thought through and made as a decision for those communities. Um, but I would also argue that Judaism has this really vibrant tradition of humor, and it has a yeah. vibrant tradition of, um, you know, in Judaism, we never celebrate joy without remembering sadness. And and in the same regard, we actually, in a way, we uphold brokenness over wholeness. And I think that if, you know, coming from a Jewish worldview or the way I write, I think you see that in the book, that Judaism is a religion, a tradition that makes space for both. That that holds both simultaneously, and I hope uh, I think I purposely tried to do that in the matzah ball. That that you know it's peaks and valleys of of uh, joy, and then also you know the truth of life, which is that sometimes things don't work out the way we want. That there's chronic illness. That you know there's parental abandonment. There's pain and suffering. But you know we do our best to make the world better. Yeah. Yeah. In the book, Rachel um, Rubenstein Goldblatt is a uh, is is such a, a such a hilarious character. Um, everything mm. about her um, is uh, it just brings me such joy. But there's there's mm. she gets in a situation where she um, she's a very successful writer, but she hides it from mm. her family because yeah. because of this awful secret that she's she's really. Um, a fan of Christmas, and she's made you know a vibrant career um, yes. on this love <laughs> that she then has to hide from her family, which uh, yeah. which is just hilarious uh, to me. Uh, did how um, it, is that a uh, um, do you know anyone uh, like that, or has that been an experience where um, you know the uh, there's a lot of cross pollination uh, between cultures, and and you know there's uh, lots of Christians that that celebrate Hanukkah, and there's yeah. uh, lots of Jewish people that celebrate Christmas, and um, you know we like to experiment with other cultures and and you know appreciate um, how what our differences are, and uh, but you know is, is have you ever experienced someone that that was in a situation like like Rachel was where you know I'm I'm not supposed to like this and but here I am and and it's actually been a pretty good experience for me. I've made a career on it. Right. So I think so I think for for Jews again it's it, we have a wide spectrum of sort of observance and things like that. Sure. So you'll you'll find that absolutely. I mean, I remember when I first went to rabbinical school and you know speaking with some new friends and saying, well, I don't know how I'll give give up a, you know, cheeseburger for the rest of my life. And and one of my friends looking at me and saying, 
I feel like I don't know how I will never go through life having never tried a cheeseburger, you know? Mm. So, so I think, you know, depending on where you are, your observance and sort of who you are as an individual, I think, yeah, I think, it, you know, it's, the book is unique to sort of the Jewish experience, obviously, but it's not unique, I think, to the human experience. I think no matter what culture your family comes from or yeah, tradition or faith background, there's always tensions, right? And, and yeah. we're supposed to be versus who we are. So I think that's universal. You know, we always are trying to find our own way in the world. And Rachel Rubenstein Goldblatt is definitely trying to find hers in this book. <laughs> <laughs> When you finish the book, um, you know, when you when you have a book like this that has a very specific outlook on the holidays and a, and a, and a unique take on it, um, was it difficult to find um, a, a publisher and an agent for that? What, what was the, the path like to getting this book out to the world? So I'll be quite honest, I never in a zillion years thought this book was going to get published. I like I said, I was writing it during the pandemic. And I was sort of at a place in my life at that point where I was just sort of writing stories for myself, writing them for fun. It was part of my sort of health and wellness journey. Um, and I sort of had seen uh, that an agent had sold, um, we said around when I finished the book, um, a Christmas uh, romance, which I believe was Holiday Swap. And I wound up just shooting out an email thinking, oh, I'll never hear from this agent. You, you, any writer knows this, right? Yeah. You sent yeah. out 100. And what happened was I heard back right away. And then uh, within a day or two, um, she had brought in another agent and they made an offer. So the book that I thought was never going to go anywhere got a wonderful, amazing uh, Carolyn Ford and Marilyn Biderman of Transatlantic, um, wonderful, fabulous agents. Um, and then, you know, a week later it went out and uh, there was multiple interest and that was that was it. So the, not to sound like an overnight success story, though, because it, it took me 10 years before yeah. I had a book that sells. You know, they say every every overnight success story is 10 years in the making. And mine right. was absolutely 10 years <laughs> in the making. I have lots and lots and lots and lots of um, manuscripts in drawers or stories I just wrote for myself. Um but it was really, it's so funny how life works out. It was really at a point when I was like just writing stories for my own joy, for my own self, um, for my nieces and nephews, for their future, um, that that everything fell into place. Um, Jean, when, when you're working on this book, um, and, and I know that you had some health challenges that, that, mm -hmm. um, you said this was part of your health and wellness journey. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, what is it about writing specifically that, um, that you use to, to try to find, uh, you know, your, your joy? Yeah, I will specify that it's writing romance for me. I didn't discover romance until my late thirties and I, I, it was such a joyful, fun, I love the fantasy aspect of it. Um, and I, being in sort of that happy, joyful place was part of my sort of healing from some of my worst years, right? So as I was getting better, I, you know, was, it was very important not to like be stressed out, not to have sort of, you know, to turn off the news, to turn off Facebook, whatever, and just sort of focus on being well, being healthy, you know, getting myself in 2% increments as good as I could get myself. You know, it's not like I'm off running marathons, but to move from being pretty much bed bound or not being able to take showers, you know, to be only able to take baths or using a wheelchair to like having some semblance of a life, this was part of my journey. So, um, brain fog, what was I saying? Um, but the point being there was that, you know, romance, uh, because it's such a joyful place, when I sit down to write, I get to be in that joyful place. And so I just feel like it's just good for me. And so when I say it's part of my like wellness and healing journey, you know, it's it allows me to sort of live separate from the painful realities of uh, my chronic illnesses. I love that. Um as you know, the book is is coming out now and, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of the early reviews. 
Uh, and it, as you talk to people or, or hear from people that have gotten such joy from this book, mm. um, knowing that, you know, where this book originated and kind of what you were going through, mm. does that bring you a, 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 a renewed sense of joy that, that you know that, that it has permeated the pages and is, is being passed on to other people now? Oh, even just hearing you say that makes me like get emotional and want to cry because <laughs> like for real, it is when, when someone reaches out to me and says, I feel seen, it makes every dark day, every bad day feel worth it. I, I cannot describe to you the joy I hear when someone says like the book, I needed this book or it made me so happy or, you know, thank you for giving a voice to what I've been through or even just thank you for giving the me the Hanukkah book I've always wanted, you know, it, it makes everything, the entire journey feel worth it. I don't think, I can't imagine a better feeling as a writer. I, I really can't. There's, n there's no amount of money or, or accolades or press that is better than, than knowing, knowing that you've made someone's day brighter. That is fantastic. Jean, we know that the, the journey of a book uh, from, from writing to publication uh, can be a long and arduous journey of, you know, yours was a decade um, in, in getting the, uh, you know, your agent. And then, you know, then when you go to the publisher and editing and all of that can be, you know, a whole other journey. And now, you know, we're at release day for the book and, and it's kind of finally out of your hands or the, you know, and, yes. and you start turning your, um, your gaze to to what might come next. Uh, how do you follow up a book like the Matzo Ball? Um, you know, I think I think it's the I, I'm trying to do exactly what I did with the Matzo Ball, which is sort of tune everything out else out, listen to my instincts, you know, choose stories that challenge me in some way because I'm not interested uh, in writing stories that don't challenge me in some way, and just you know, exactly the instinct that drove the matzo ball, which was, you know, to give voice to experiences that often aren't given voice, that aren't seen. So, you know, I have the second, my second book, Mr. Perfect on Paper, uh, is in revisions right now. Um, I have my third book being started, and I just actually the other day came up with a fourth book uh, and so idea for it. So, you know, just moving forward and just keep trying to do good work and get better and better and and be there for people who need a voice that's fantastic so we know that there's much more coming down the road uh yeah. gene Meltzer. but today when you're hearing this the matzo ball is available everywhere and you can grab it in kindle edition or uh you know a physical book that you can hold in your hands and turn pages or if you prefer audiobooks you can get it from audible as well there's links to all those great places in the show notes of this episode gene if people are just discovering you and want to follow along and you know for your journey going forward and, and dig into all the great stuff that you do where can they connect with you online sure uh, my website is genemeltzer.com i'm also on instagram and facebook and you should definitely seek me out i love love hearing from readers Awesome. We will put links uh, to those places where they can connect with you as well. Jean, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you for oh, yes. taking time to come on the show. Thank We're going to send to everyone to pick up their copy of the Matzo Ball. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great, great time. And we'll cut it right there. Uh, that was fantastic, Jean. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fun. Well, thanks. And I'm glad we uh, got to connect. Sorry about that. Uh, no, you know, no problem. Getting. No problem at all. Gave me time to relax, actually. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, when we release this next week, I'll send you a link to it and we'll promote it everywhere. Thank you so much, Hank. Great. Thanks, Gene. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I was walking through the woods between Wolfert's Roost and the future site of my father's stone manor house. The house would eventually stand on what had been old Baltus's pumpkin field, the land where I had found my grandfather's head. Father had chosen the spot for its view of the Hudson River. Knoll was to be a grand mansion in the Gothic Revival style, but at the time the mansion was but a few foundations of Van Brunt stone. I had become fond of the place already the idea of it, and I spent many a night alone in a shack on the property. 
My mother disapproved. She would have me sleep in the room across from hers in our townhouse. But I was fifteen and did not answer to her. I kept a bottle of spirits hidden in the crook of two walnut trees near old Baltus's grave. I thought he would approve of the gesture. I had stopped along my way to fetch it out. At the moment the first pull of liquor touched my throat, I heard a ghastly, inhuman laugh. I was not alone in the woods. Had God sent the horseman after me? Had I sinned that terribly? I ran through the wood and found the field where Knoll was to be built. The outline of the foundations was barely discernible beneath the snow. An apparition stood there. Though I have seen him many times since, I shall never forget my first glimpse. Gaunt in moonlight, headless, exuding power and malice. A magic thing in the land of the ordinary. The headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. What chills those words evoke. It charged at me, hatchet raised. I stood transfixed, unable to move, unable to even imagine escape. This was the servant of God, after all, sent to strike down sinners. I hurled the bottle from my hand, ashamed that I had become a drunkard as Baltus had been. It shattered against the foundations of Knoll. I stretched out my arms and awaited judgment. A piercing white light broke the darkness. The horse reared. Not my Dylan, cried Agatha, appearing from the wood. She held a skull in her hand. It shone brightly as a diamond, and in that moment I understood. The horseman did not serve God. He served my grandmother. Perhaps in that moment I came to see Agatha and God as one and the same. The unholy spirit fought her command. A foreleg of the demon horse struck my head with such power that I fell backwards with a cry and knew no more. I carry the scar to this day. A slight indentation in my temple, barely noticeable. In my days of courting I was told that when I am angry the patch of insulted skull bone will stand out in a disturbing manner. I have never had occasion to see this phenomenon, however, as I am generally well pleased whenever I pass a mirror. <laughs>